Let's get Kenny Marshall on screen here. Kenny Marshall, who organized military for Kokesh during the presidential campaign. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Adam, thanks for having me on. Can you hear me okay? Lima Charlie, brother, looking good. Nice. So. Tell, tell us by, by way of background a little bit about your military experience and how it relates to your political awakening. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you might be a couple years older than me. I'm not quite sure. I joined in 2004. 38. Yeah, okay. So four yeah. years. I'm 34. Yeah, I'm old core like that. I, I enlisted in 2000. <laughs> oh, so before September 11th. Well, actually, yeah, that is kind of an important distinction, uh, unfortunately, yeah. now, because uh, I get to say, I joined the military before it was cool. I mean, before it was 9-11 trendy, right? Yeah, I actually enlisted in uh, delayed entry program 1999 boot camp July, uh, June 18, 2000, you know, one of, the, one of those dates you remember, but yeah. Uh, and then people said, oh, you're, a, you're an Iraq veteran. And I was like, no, I joined... I joined before that, and I probably would yeah. not have been swayed by that one way or another. Yeah, so I, I went in 2004, so September 11th was still very, very fresh in our minds. And, of course, I was a young, tender age of 18, very ignorant, as most of us are. And, uh, yeah, I, I joined when I was 17 as well. My parents had a sign for me. Um, and, you know, gung-ho, ready to save the world. And uh, I'll never forget one of the most distinctful things that I remember of boot camp is maybe about a week before graduation. I'm I'm Navy, by the way. Um, they had it. They put us in. Okay, I'll forgive you. <laughs> so I knew, I knew it was coming eventually. Um, so they put us in a room about a week before graduation, and they said, "You know, we want to remind you why you're joining because maybe you forgot." And they had a TV. They rolled the TV out and they played this video of the towers on smoke and the towers falling and that whole, and that whole thing. And you're kind of standing by everybody just looking around and people start crying and getting emotional. And people are like, yeah, I can't wait to get in there. I can't wait to get on the ship and just, you know, fight for freedom, you know? And so when I went in, it was still very, very, very fresh. Um, and the military only did one honest thing that I can remember. And I remember, you know, when you sit in that room and you request to where, you know, where you would like to go be stationed at. And uh, so I put on there, I wanted to be stationed in Japan on an aircraft carrier. And they did exactly that. That's the only thing they ever did for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, but of course, when I got there, uh, there were a lot of regulations and things like that, which of course I had no idea of. Um, Maybe about a year or two before I got there, a Marine in Okinawa raped and killed a Japanese uh, girl. Yeah. And that kind of kicked it all off. And even when I was there about a year in, a sailor from my ship uh, went out and robbed and killed an old woman in Tokyo. And so you had these events going off. Now, hold on, Kenny, 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 if I, if I may to go back and examine this phenomenon for a second for people in our audience who are not familiar and might find those sort of headlines that you just threw out there somewhat uh, implausible or unbelievable. Um, what he's talking about is troops deployed overseas where the bases are basically the same as they are in the United States in terms of entry and exit control. It's a place of work where you live and when you're not on duty, you're able to just drive off the base and do whatever you want. And one of the consequences of this that has been around for as long as this situation has existed is Marines going out and partying on the town, whether or not they're allowed to or supposed to, and MPs having to go out and tell uh, the locals, hey, sorry about that. We'll rein our boys in. We'll hold them. Oh, yeah, we'll pay for that broken window. Our bad. Sorry about that. And and that's sort of like the, uh, you know, the, the, the hunky-dory version of the story, right? But what really happens is when you have a 
population from another country like the U.S. military that is conditioned to dehumanize a population that they are deployed amongst that looks completely different from them, you end up with a dehumanized relationship that often results in these kinds of uh, international incidents and atrocities uh, maybe atrocities uh, is a bit of an exaggeration here. But in the United States, we have service members who are in the same situation, go off base, get drunk and disorderly, commit crimes. Get, and we think of it as no big deal because they're part of the population here. But what you have overseas and where Okinawa in particular as a large marine presence has become a hot spot is when you have incidents of rape and murder as uh, disturbing trends. And, and I, I, don't, I, I don't want to sound like I have statistics to back this up, but there is a unique phenomena, uh, particularly in Okinawa and other US military bases in Asia where the command allows these things to happen. The troops are not quarantined to their bases and then these incidents happen. So uh, is, is that a good background, you think, Kenny, for, for, for these stories yeah, you're I, relating here? Yeah, I would, I would say, uh, you know, of course, after World War II, America dismantled the Japanese Navy and kind of just took over. So the Japanese, all they had really had, even when I was there, was a basic Coast Guard with a few submarines, nothing much. Um, but I would definitely say 80s going into the 90s, late 90s. That's what you how you described it was exactly like that. But when the girl in Okinawa was raped and killed and a few sailors were running around doing dumb shit as well in Tokyo, because, of course, Okinawa and Tokyo is completely two separate locations. Um, then they started cracking down. They started cracking down real hard. And basically, they anybody, I believe it was under E5 and below, wasn't able to leave the base at all uh, unless you had a family. So basically anybody under, for the most part, what, 22, 23, right. weren't able to leave leave the base. Well, Kenny, um, before, you, before you move on to the specifics, I do want to point out one other uh, in, important element here uh, for background. When you mentioned these stories, and there have been, uh, and most of these, they, these don't make American mainstream media news, right? Almost nope. never do there. I mean, they'll be there like as a footnote, you know, like it'll, it'll get a, a blurb in the New York Times, maybe when something like this happens. But this never gets discussed in American nope. media. Uh, but these stories that you mentioned, mm -hmm. these are not. Well, maybe we have some evidence and a local cop is going after some American servicemen. No, 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 no. These are stories with irrefutable evidence, with confessions, with, with where, where, where the troops who, who committed these crimes have been caught or confessed. There, there are enough, like, and, and there are enough of these stories. I mean, I have personally read dozens just in my covering of the news, not even with any particular military interest since I got out. And I don't even cover most of them. Because it's like, oh, yeah, that happened again. It's not news in and of itself. But we're not we're not talking about maybe cases. We're talking about cases that are irrefutably proven that are really more representative of uh, a tip of an iceberg. Fair? Yeah, for sure. And as I said before, when I got there, the, 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 the Marine killing the Japanese girl, uh, it was a teenager, I believe, they had already implemented the first round of, I guess, restrictions. So when I got there, they told us, oh, you got to be back before midnight. Um, and in order to stay out past midnight, you had to get this qual and that qual, which typically took you at least a year or two to get it. Um, and But it didn't even make it that far. Eventually, a sailor went out and did, as I said, and uh, he was on my ship. And I'll never forget when it happened. He he did it late at night and he literally committed the robbery and the killing, came back on base, went back on the ship, went into his rack and fell asleep. And of course, the Japanese police discovered this old lady dead in front of her condo or whatever. 
they 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 have suspicion or maybe cctv or something like that they they're like okay yeah this guy's military because we stand out like a sore thumb all over japan obviously and, and a like whatever tracking license plates too right on, on a case like this um yeah i mean w- whatever way, happened had, yeah they, i, they had, I don't they had, Either way, they had a normal standard of oh, law enforcement don't. evidence to go after the guy. I mean, and the thing is, is that, you know, you have to go all the way back to even in the 50s and 60s when we took over the military there where they they told the U.S. government, like, we don't want anything nuclear here. Now, I was on the last steam driven aircraft carrier, the USS Kitty Hawk. It was the last one. Everything else was nuclear. And they the, the U.S. Navy kept pushing. They wanted to, you know, change out the USS Kitty Hawk because it was it was an old ship. And they wanted to replace it with a nuclear ship. And the Japanese fought tooth and nail for years. Um, even up to the point when I got out, the Kitty Hawk was still there. Um, so they already had this resentment f- based off the war. I mean, especially the the elderly people that were in their 60s and 70s who, you know, witnessed this stuff happen as they were kids. And so, you know, you can feel that. I remember sitting on the train and an old Japanese guy would just be staring at me for no reason. And I'm just like, what's this guy's problem? And I was young at the time. So... I didn't think about this type of shit, you know. I had this, this, uh, this bravado of Why like, oh, I'm in the they military. Love us all over the world. Yeah, We've yeah. We've been so nice to everybody. Exactly. So, so all the pieces of the puzzle obviously come together after um, I get out, and you know, my mind opens up. But during the time, you know, I would so basically to make the make a long story short. That was my biggest battle because I kind of that's when I really discovered like, well, this doesn't make sense to me. So basically what you're asking me to do is you're saying put on this uniform and you need to die if you have to. Like you're going to go out to sea for six months out of the year. There might be a Russian plane that flies over and just blows us all to hell. You might die. But don't forget, you got to be back before midnight. How dare you go past by midnight? And if you, if you come if you come one minute late. You're going to you're going to see the captain. They're going to bust you down. They're going to take your money. They're going to put you in the brig. They're going to cr- treat you like a criminal. And so many young sailors were just petrified of this, you know, because they really instilled this and just drove it home. And of course, you know, I'm rebellious by nature. And that's when I kind of realized that this doesn't make any sense. So, you know, and then so I just started rebelling and once you start rebelling against the U.S. military, that's like the worst thing to ever rebel against. It's worse than rebelling against the, the police. Like they basically just make you feel like you're lower than than a what my grandpa used to say, a snake's belly, you know, like make you feel lower than dog shit. Well, if, and, if I may um, point out to people about that, the, the enlistment document, remember, there is no contract. Mm-hmm. You do not have a contract when you join the military. Yeah. You have an enlistment document. A contract, mm. by definition, <clears throat> is something that binds multiple parties to agreed upon term. The enlistment yep. document is more like a legal pledge of your life. It's you signing over your life, it, and it says in, on the document, terms and conditions may change at any time with no notice to me whatsoever, and I'll take it. Mm. So the the military, when you rebel against the military, they basically get to constantly go, hey, remember when you told us that we own you? Well, we still own you. But no, 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 we still, no, until we say we don't, we own you. Yep, yep. And I think for me, it was, I I remember I I got in trouble once. I went to captain's mass for breaking curfew, obviously, because I said, fuck it, I'm going to go get drunk and not come back. Let's see what happens. Um, So they proved their point. And after that happened, I was like, okay, well, this is not the route that I want to go because, I mean, I went in, I did four years of Marine Corps ROTC. I went in as an E3. I had everything paved out for me, you know what I mean? And so I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to just keep getting busted down. Like, what's the point? So I actually tried to say, you know what, let me let me just take a deep breath and just make it out. At that point, I had maybe like a year left. So I said, let me just try to push this out. And um the funniest thing is I, I, I submitted a request shit to leave my department and it got declined all the way up to the captain and the captain approved it. So the, so then they, they moved me out of my department and put me in another department, a brand new group of people, literally. And I was like the outcast and it, they put me in a department that I had, I had no knowledge of. Like I went in as an engineer 
and they put me in with with like quartermasters you know what i mean so and so i was like okay this is a fresh start like i, I might actually make it out of here you know what i mean i get out of my department i'm gonna make it out of here and um they have this thing in the navy where everybody has to do what they call mess cranking you got to work in the kitchen every sailor has to do it so you you go through this i think it's like three months or something like that and i'm going through it and while you're mess cranking you're no longer a part of whatever department you come from. You're now a part of the, the mess cranking department. And uh, we pulled into Hong Kong, I remember, and they told us, you know, you got to go off the Liberty buddy. So you, the person you leave with, you got to come back with. And if you don't, you're going to go to captain's mass. So just my luck, my Liberty buddy got fucking piss ass drunk somewhere. So then I didn't know what to do. I remember I had duty that next morning. So it's like, do I not go to duty? Do I try to find my Liberty buddy? <laughs> so I ended up going back anyways. They, they, they busted me down again. And, um, that was the point where I was like, you know what, like, this is, this is basically the end of my story here. And, um, and I, I even remember my senior chief pleaded to uh, the master chief saying like, look, he's already been through a lot. Let's just put this under the rug. You'll give us some extra duty or something. Don't put him through captain's mass again. And the master was like, nope, he broke the rules. I don't care. He's going. And when that happened, I just it just broke me down so it really dismantled me as a person. And I became so angry and so enraged. And I didn't understand, you know, why this was happening. And all my dreams were kind of crushed before me. And I that's when it kind of just started for me. So when I processed out and I got out and uh, ended up moving back to Japan as a civilian and just laid out this whole new uh just a whole new pathway for myself. And, uh, you know, I was an athlete before I got into the military. So I started getting back into that and uh, ended up, you know, here I am 16 years later and have made a life for myself, a career for myself. And a lot of that had just a lot of self-motivation, you know, what I went through in a way really set the tone and motivated me to really like wake up and really see what's going on. And um, so, yeah, that's basically my, uh, my whole little, story in a nutshell and um so i went back to japan as civilian as i said and ended up playing professional soccer all around southeast asia for about six or seven years then i um coached uh kids and then i started studying into different different elements of fitness and health and now i run my i run two businesses here um in thailand in bangkok i have uh, two gyms that i run and i have one coming up in the states as well are, so, are, you, are you just sidebar here are you uh facing corona lockdowns for the gyms yeah so basically i had a so when you were campaigning for president um i had this whole outline i was going to come back in the states back in like late march early april and um had plans to meet up with you at garden of uh, garden of freedom freedom of garden whatever. yeah garden of freedom, right? garden of freedom. yeah yeah the garden of freedom yeah so i had all these plans out and uh yeah corona hit airport shut down uh thailand mm -hmm. i was in thailand at the time they didn't allow anybody to come in and out so i'm still stuck here now here we are in july um which is not necessarily a bad thing considering on what i'm seeing on the news every single day in America. And Thailand is relatively a good place to be right now. I mean, the cases are relatively low. You know, Thai people in general are very obedient uh, to the government. So everybody wears masks and everybody kind of falls in line. And, and you know, they've, they've came out pretty well. Um, and the cases have been very, relatively very low. So the businesses are still running. Everything is very local though. So there is literally zero international tourism, which is detrimental to the Thai, Thai economy. Um, but they're doing the best that they can. And of course, just like most places in the world, suicide rate is, you know, skyrocketing, people losing their jobs. And of course, the, the poor people of Thailand is far, far greater than what it is in the state. So uh, they're suffering big time. And uh, for me personally, I'm doing okay. My 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 gyms are are running pretty much full steam ahead, um, so uh, I'm thankful in that regard. But uh, yeah, I mean that's kind of segues into why I wanted to reach out to you, and you know, kind of just watching this whole Corona thing unfold from abroad, and and you know, it's hard not to stay away from the 
the, the CNNs and the MSNBCs and all that stuff. It's hard for me, especially living abroad. You try to get your news as quickly as you can because I'm always on the move. And uh, and it just it, I, I just feel like sometimes I watch the news, you know, how your brain just feels like it's splitting in half. And it, I, I don't know. I can't really wrap my head around it anymore. And for me, coming from a fitness background, now going into close to 16 years, almost half of my life, I, I look at it as objectively as possible. And for me, as a, as a, just as a personal trainer, I've had to deal with many different types of people coming in and out of my life, coming to me to, to want to lose weight, to, excuse me, to want to lose weight, to want to better their life. And they have many different health conditions. You know, they can have diabetes, they can have obesity, they can have many different things. So when I look at a virus and I watch the numbers go up and down and I see all the fear that is being perpetuated in the States. For me, I had to take pause and I'm like, well, isn't there a much bigger problem that nobody wants to talk about that nobody cares about that is now somehow not important. And so then I really started questioning things and I went on Google. It took me 10 minutes because I'm like, there's no way this virus is even close to diseases that plague America yearly. Ridiculous amount of numbers of people die from different diseases in America. So I'm like, there's just no way, right? Because I deal with these people personally and I know how serious it is. So did a real quick Google search. And if, if you may, if you allow me, I'll just read a couple off real quick just to kind of give people um, an idea of where I'm coming from here. And this is not to try to compare it necessarily or compare and contrast the coronavirus, but more so highlight and shine a light on something that I think that people need to recognize and understand on why the deaths of Corona are what they are. And right off the bat, the number one killer in America as of 2019 and will still be of 2020 is heart disease. In 2019, it killed 647,000 people. Yeah. Over a, over a half a million people were, were, have died of heart disease, right? Obesity. Yeah, what, what, if, what if every time someone said wear a mask, instead they said eat your greens or yeah, yeah. don't be a pig? 100%. Yeah, be a way so, better direction of those efforts for public health, right? 100%. And you can, and you can go down... Uh, the list, but the top five for me is heart disease, liver disease, obesity, smoking, and diabetes. Right. They're These all lifestyle related. Causes. Exactly. And they're all preventable. Yes. And that's, and that is the key that people need to understand. We're not talking about HIV. We're not talking about even cancer because cancer is debatable. Rather it's lifestyle or sometimes well, cancer you, just is both. you can say yeah. cancer is both. Exactly. You can absolutely say cancer can be due to lifestyle with smoking and other risk factors that you take on. And it can be Correct. completely caused by something outside of that. But when Correct. it's like you got type two diabetes because you ate like a pig, you know, you got heart disease because you were 200 pounds overweight most of your adult life. You, yep. you, you know, you, you, they, yeah, you chose to die that way. Yeah, exactly. So it's it, when you understand these numbers, and you can just you can take heart disease and because there's so many different factors which will cause heart disease. I mean, if you smoke, you can get heart disease. Um, if you're obese, you can get heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that number, six hundred forty seven thousand. If OK, this is a very optimistic if Americans were much healthier, more health conscious, took it serious. There was more emphasis through through families, through uh, through social interactions through just being around people that actually cared about each other instead of themselves. And we cut that number in half. Let's say it's only 300,000 people died in 2019 of heart disease. Would the number now of coronavirus be whatever it is now, 130 something thousand? No, it probably even wouldn't even, it probably wouldn't even cap over 50,000. So that's why people are getting sick and people are unfortunately passing away. And trust me, my my heart bleeds to know that people are getting a virus, not being able to overcome it and uh, and passing away. So when I approach people with my libertarian mind, obviously, 
when they try to say, well, what do you think about the coronavirus? Do you think it's real or not? Do you think I should wear a mask or not? And I just say, look, I'm not going to get into that debate, but I will say this. The healthier you are, the stronger you are. If you can tell five loved ones to eat healthier, take care of their bodies, if every person did that and told five people that, the world would be a much better place. Um, but we don't. And it's all about sharing that positivity and that love and that prosperity. And so that's that's how I look at the whole coronavirus thing. And, um, you know, another big one, of course, we hear on the, on the news is the elderly, right? It's like young people don't go out because if you get it, you can give it to your grandparents, which is true. But, you know, I remember my grandpa telling me before he, uh, before he passed away, he told me, you know, he said, I've been drinking two bourbons every night at eight o'clock for the last 50 years. I'm 85 now. If I die tomorrow because I, my liver doesn't work anymore, well, goddamn, I've lived pretty, pretty damn good life. And that always stuck with me because, you know, as much as we want to protect and we love our grandparents, you know, we all we all live and we all die. That's part of life. And I tried to live by three basic principles, which is health, freedom. And the third one is to do both of those to the absolute fullest. If you do those three, then you'll leave your mark here on earth and people are going to recognize you, never forget you. You're going to pass that on to your loved ones, to your family members and et cetera. And so that's just my mind and how it works in a nutshell, I guess I can say. But that's yeah. That's beautiful, Kenny. Hey, if, I, if I may take it back to the, uh, the military issue here, because having gone through everything that you experienced and having gained the perspective that you have now, uh, I, I want to point out there's a great website, first of all, for anybody who's watching who is entangled legally with the military in any way called girightshotline.org. And I will plug this website and organization until we completely overcome militarism. And as long as you have militarism, militaries will abuse individuals. And if you are enlisted and like if you if you sign the contract and then and then did your research instead of the other way around, you know, uh, and that happens a lot. People get carried away or seduced by the romanticism of a recruiter presenting military life and you get to travel all over the world and meet people in Okinawa who hate you. Uh, and, and then you do your research and you go, man, I want, I want out of this. There are plenty of ways out. These are the people that will help you. And I imagine, Kenny, in your case, it would have made for a much smoother transition at very least. What are your words of advice for someone considering joining the military today or someone who's in the military today who finds themselves part of an evil machine that they don't want to be a part of anymore? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I actually, last time I was back in the States uh, last year, uh, I went to my old high school. Um, I asked if I can speak on the campus and talk about this because I used to sit in that classroom and I used to sit in that chair and I used to think that military was the only way out. And I wanted to be able to speak to young people, you know, especially 17, 18 years old, senior year in high school. And they feel a lot of, you know, I think you would agree. I think you mentioned this many times. It's it's ignorance. It's greed. It's the other ones that you pointed out. I, I remember you for the people that wanted to join the military at a young age. But a lot of it is because they just don't know where else to go. You know, they their parents don't have any money to put them through college. They have some, you know, bullshit job working at Jack in a Box or something like that. They got no money. Um, and they just want to make they just want to find a new future. And so I, I wasn't necessarily one of those because I was more of your, you know, I want to go save the world type, but there are a lot of people that um, join for the reasons of just trying to, to make a better life for themselves and for their family, for, for a lot of them. And I would just remind them that the world is a very big and beautiful place. America is a very big and beautiful place. And there are, always options for you all you have to do especially now 
is go online and think about something that you love to do, whatever it may be, and dig deep. You don't, and you know, this goes into, do I need to get a degree to be successful? I don't have a degree and I operate three businesses around the world. So you don't need a degree. You don't need somebody telling you that you have to do something. It's that you know what you love and enjoy and you go out and get it. Don't let anybody stop you. And, you know, my family was kind of a burden as well, trying to weigh me down. And that was another reason why it kind of pushed me out the door before, you know, basically on graduation. And so you have to be able to fight through these. And I think young people now in 2020 are better off than what I was, or even when you were Adam, when you were 18, because they do have the access to the internet. They do have access to more information. Information's coming in f faster and it's traveling faster and people, you know, people are talking. And it's this new generation. So I would, my, my, my advice for number one, somebody that wants to join is, as I just said, there, America is an amazing country and there is nothing wrong with having the feeling like I want to serve my country. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you need to think about what exactly are you serving? What exactly will you be doing? by putting on that uniform and use critical thinking skills. And that would be my advice. My, my last thing that I want to do is to say, you know, don't, don't do this because, you know, my experience was bad, but I would share my experience and I say, don't make the same mistake. And, Amen. and for the people that are currently in that feel like they're trapped and there's no way out and they're just stuck there, you know, when I was going through what I was going through, they would just tell me, oh, you know, if you're having a hard time, Seaman Marshall, just go see the chaplain. He'll take care of you. And then, of course, you go see the chaplain and he's like, oh, God, this guy again. What's going on, Marshall? What are you doing? Oh, OK. Yeah, you hate the military. Well, go call your dad, you know, whatever. <laughs> and 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 so you're literally you do literally feel like you're by yourself and half the people in your company or your division or whatever branch of service you're in, they're not going to like you because they feel like you're a, you're a burden and you're in their way and you're a complainer and you don't want to do what you're told. And so that makes you feel low. And then you might have a few guys here and there that might be like, yeah, we understand what you're talking about, man, but just, just keep it down. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. So you're literally, feel like you're by yourself. But I think with the resources that you just provided here, um, it, it is a huge step forward. And I think that when you, you're obviously listening to this stream and you, you know, Adam, you now hear from me, you hear from other veterans and they share their stories and you should have a good grasp of the, the direction that you're going. And you already see the light. You already understand that what you're doing isn't right. And this is not what you signed up for. And you need to take grasp of your own personal freedoms because the government, the military, they don't care about care what you feel, you know? Did we just lose Kenny? Well, I can't think of a better way to end that. That was so beautifully said. I would just go one step farther. You know me, that when you join the military today, if you're doing it, for the right reasons, and you think that that is serving your country, then joining the military is dangerously, recklessly naive. But if you're in any way caught up in that, check out uh, jritotline.com. And for more on Kenny, you can see uh, the link to his uh, YouTube channel there, The Eternal Beast. Uh, hosted by Kenny Marshall. So you see, he's, he's just starting that channel with 95 subscribers. Check the link below, please. Let's get him up there to a thousand so at least he can get verified and start doing live shows and bringing his wisdom to a bigger audience.